It's time for the Bible Geek. I am that geek. Robert M. Price, Robert M. Price, postmodern, deconstruct, super-powered demigod. Yes, friends, it's time once again for the Bible Geek. And I'm the Bible Geek, Robert M. Price, and I'm taking a bit of a respite from working on a book uh, to uh, deal with some questions in the ever-mounting pile of uh, great questions for the Bible Geek, so let's get to them. Uh, this is one that's uh, very straightforward, but I'm not sure if the answer is. Ken says, can you provide a Bible timeline that addresses the time periods when each piece was put together? and when the Bible as a whole would have been accepted by the modern religions of, of that time, which I assume means, of course, the religions that are still with us, um, you know, from that time when the canons were accepted. So uh, to deal with the second part first, since it's the easier one, it uh, it seems, now, and a lot of these things are, are kind of iffy. The evidence is not unequivocal, but it's a pretty good case to be made for the notion that the, um, that the Tanakh, the Hebrew canon, was uh, fixed, uh, set uh, late in the first century by the Yavna Sanhedrin, that is the, the uh, purely religious uh, Jewish council after the um, Third, some 30 years after the uh, the war with Rome and the destruction of the temple. And what we read is, th in, in what sources we have about this, implies that they didn't just slap it together, they didn't compile it then, but they made definitive decisions on a few books that some people thought probably should not be in the canon. Uh, implying that generally they were used already, but uh, there were doubts to be resolved. And um, I think a little earlier than that, the, uh, the sages had decided that what we call the Apocrypha or the Deuterocanonical books shouldn't be in there. These were the books in Greek, some originally in Greek, like the Wisdom of Solomon, some translated uh, from Hebrew into Greek, like uh, uh, Ecclesiasticus, that is, Sirach. Uh, and uh, th these were books that were part of the Greek Septuagint that was used by diaspora Jews through the Mediterranean who uh, did not really read Hebrew anymore. And there was interest uh, in these books by various uh, sympathetic um, Greek speakers who were Gentiles too. So uh, there, that was, uh, and this was the... Uh, the edition of the Bible most of the early Christians used, but the uh, Jewish uh, sa sages and scribes in uh, the Holy Land uh, didn't want to have non-Hebrew books. I figured that uh, you know that, that can't be right. Uh, Hebrew is a sacred language and all that. So uh, anything that uh, wasn't in Hebrew and was exclusive to the Septuagint uh, didn't fly. And so this uh, so around uh, a little bit earlier a first stage would have been to uh, eliminate the the so-called apocrypha which is why they're called apocrypha literally apocrypha means the hidden writings uh, and the denotation here was that though there was nothing necessarily wrong with them uh, they weren't heretical or anything they were not brought out for public reading in the cycle of uh, readings in synagogues, uh, not part of the lectionary. Everything else was, you know, sooner or later you'd read through the whole of the canon, but uh, they didn't include these. They didn't try to burn them, anything like that, right? It was just that they were not considered to be scripture. Uh, wise books, sure, there's always room for plenty of those, but uh, not really uh, the, the scriptures. Uh, but uh, then the the ones that uh, were in Hebrew that caused some people to hesitate uh, were, for instance, the Song of Solomon, also known as the Song of Songs, the Canticles, the Canticle of Canticles, whatever. 
right? This uh, book, some thought to be dubious because for one thing, it doesn't really mention God. And for another, it's a little on the racy side. Uh, the euphemisms are pretty thin veils. And uh, it, uh, it already had... Um, aroused uh, suspicion or hostility because originally it must have been uh, a song, uh, a, a liturgical, uh, antiphonal uh, song back and forth between uh, Ishtar Shalmuth and Tammuz. And uh, Tammuz was the dying god and uh, Ishtar went to the netherworld to bring him back up. And uh, that, which is why you have all these things about my, oh, they were brother and sister too, just like Isis and Osiris. And that's why you have all this stuff like my sister, my bride, and uh, love is stronger than death and so forth. Well, it was all right to worship these gods. In fact, Ezekiel tells us that uh, there were w women of Jerusalem who were uh, in the time of the Babylonian exile worshiping or mourning Tammuz, that is ritual mourning for the dying god. Well, uh, this uh, became problematical once worship was centralized and focused on Yahweh or Jehovah, right? These other gods were uh, eliminated. In fact, you read through the Deuteronomic history how, depending on which king was on the throne, they would kick out or bring back in the um, statues of Asherah, the bride of uh, Yahweh and so forth. Uh, some wanted or some didn't. And Josiah and Hezekiah getting rid of various other gods, Nehushtan and so on. Uh, Barbara, I'm sorry, uh, Margaret Barker, I'm not with it today, um, has this whole fascinating comprehensive theory on how the Deuteronomic reformed radically transformed polytheistic Israelite religion into monotheistic Judaism. And uh, this kind of change meant that you, you couldn't have, you know, uh, hymns to other gods and so on, not anymore, right? And uh, so what did they do? Well, everybody liked it, so they just kind of uh, sanitized it. Uh, Ishtar Shalmuth became the Shulamite, and uh, the, the name uh, Tammuz was just dropped. But you kind of, you know, once you know about them, you can recognize who this is and what's going on. And uh, but even if you so so that was in the past already. But still, it was the, the, this uh, love between uh, the uh, the one and the other described in pretty explicit terms. And now, uh, all right, you know, love and romance are fine. Nobody had a problem with that. But uh, is that all this is? It was a very similar problem that Muslims have had with the Surah of Joseph in the Quran. Yeah, it's a good story. Uh, must be true because it's in the scripture. But why? You know, why is a love story in, in the scripture? Same sort of a problem. And uh, so uh, the uh, the rabbis eventually said, look, th this is not what it seems. This is an allegory of the love and devotion between God and his bride Israel, an image you find in Hosea and elsewhere. And, of course, in later centuries, Christians used the same dodge to say it's about Christ and the church, taking their clue from Ephesians, right? Uh, but uh, it, it's a spin, that's for sure. And that's that spin is uh, what enabled it to, to keep its uh, toehold in the canon. We, we're told that some Jews use this in the taverns as a drinking song, which, uh, which means they understood what it meant. Uh, but uh, and so that, of course, must have uh, fueled the fire for some of the blue nose pious to try to get rid of this thing. And uh, but uh, the the rabbis tried to explain it away. And uh, and I find this really fascinating too. 
They said, uh, you think this is not a holy book? Oh, no, no. This is the most holy of the books because of this allegory about God's love for Israel and vice versa. Uh, and uh, the way they put it was, this one defiles the hands. That is, if you touched anything sacred, uh, you were without ritual preparation. You were defiled. You were made unclean because it was an illegitimate boundary crossing. The scripture, the temple vessels, whatever, were not unclean. Uh, and you not weren't necessarily either but uh, uh, you you had to go through the, the jump through the hoops ritually to, to be able to, to touch the holy thing and if you did it without preparation uh, you were defiled I mean the the greatest case of that was this poor uh, Uza guy was that it Uzi uh, the, the name of the machine gun after him uh, I can never quite remember that he he's he touched the ark to keep it from falling off the ox cart into the ditch a good thing to do, but uh, he had no, it, given the circumstances, he couldn't have had ritual preparation to touch it, and so even though he saved it from going into the mud, God blasted him on the spot, and uh, the, of course that contrast is intentional and explicit, because the point is, the rules of, of rituals and their transgression it has nothing to do with morality. Sin is not basically moral, it is ritual and ceremonial in character. Well, all that to say, they said that uh, the Song of Solomon defiles the hands, it is extra holy. Uh, so that's a kind of... Uh, I guess the pendulum swinging back to the other extreme, right? Oh, you say it's uh, not worthy of being in the Bible? Look, it's just the opposite. It's the holiest book in there. So there, uh, this, by the way, sorry for a digression, can't resist it. This is why the Gospel of John was credited to the Apostle John, the son of Zebedee, uh, making it an apostolic work of the highest order, uh, because there were people that wanted to have the, the Gospel of John banned, the so-called allogoi, or allogai, I think it's where I've seen it spelled both ways, the, those uh, without the logos. And uh, they said, look, this book is Gnostic, uh, and furthermore was written by the Gnostic Serinthus. Now, was that just a guess, too, or was that actually the fact... I don't know, but it certainly does have all kinds of Mandean and uh, Marcionite parallels in it. I mean, you can see what they meant. Uh, and uh, so what did they do? So, oh, no, 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 you're not getting rid of that gospel. Heretical? Hell no. It's it's the greatest one there is. So, you know, it's written by the Apostle John. So there, same, same sort of thing. Okay, sorry, real digression. Uh, keep in mind, you know, pretty much senile and just vacantly rambling here. Uh, Ecclesiastes, now not Ecclesiasticus, which was already uh, voted off of the uh, the uh, the island uh, because it was only surviving in in uh, Greek. Though now we have the Hebrew original, but they didn't. Um, uh, that one was already gone, right? But Ecclesiastes, also in Hebrew, Koheleth, the preacher. Some people thought, I, what is this? Uh, it, it's all right, it mentions God, and there's a few pious statements, but it kind of looks like they, uh, they're just in there to uh, cover the tracks, because this book, is, if you've ever read it, you know, is full of hedonism and pessimism. Uh, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's like chasing after the wind. What's the point? Uh, the, the righteous and the wicked, they all come to the same end. Humans, animals, they eventually expire and go into the ground from which they were taken. What, what's the point? And finally he says, well, about the best thing you can do is to apply your efforts to your work and uh, don't forget about God, but that's about it. Uh, and uh, whoa, you know, that's, uh, people still have loads of trouble with this. I, I just can never get over how the Schofield Reference Bible tries to justify the inclusion of Ecclesiastes by saying, okay, this is not really true. This is not the proper Christian sense of priorities and all that. So why is it in the Bible? Well, <laughs> it's an inspired statement of what you shouldn't believe. 
you've got to be kidding me, right? I mean, you're really opening Pandora's box there, because you, you're you're going straight to the most liberal approach that the Bible is just a museum of different viewpoints, but they're willing to do it to cover the butt of Ecclesiastes. Again, I'm not criticizing it, but uh, they had big problems with it. But, you know, the sages... Uh, said, now, nah, it's, it's good enough, it's godly enough, uh, so you know, in it stays. The Book of Esther, well, there were Greek parts of the Book of Esther that existed in the Septuagint. I mean, the whole thing was in Greek, but there were parts in Greek that weren't in the Hebrew. And these parts mentioned God and his providence and all that. But the Hebrew didn't. No mention of God at all. Now, it's all about the deliverance of Israel by the courageous actions of uh, Queen Esther and, you know, the story. And, uh, and, and of course, God's providence is, is screamingly implicit, if that makes any sense, in the uh, story. Like when uh, Mordecai, Esther's uncle, says, you know, you're the only one that has any chance to get the king to call off this pogrom they're planning. Uh, I know you're you're afraid of what's going to happen if you get up the guts to go ask him not to let this proceed. You could just be killed on the spot as part of it. But uh, maybe you've come to the, the throne for just such a time as this. Well, obvious, and that is what happens. She intervenes and they're all saved. And so, of course, it's all about divine providence, but which is why it did wind up in the canon, even in the uh, No God Hebrew version. But some people thought, boy, you know, if a book's going to be in the Bible, it ought to mention God. So problem, but not insurmountable. Some had a problem with Ezekiel because uh, it uh, gives this revealed blueprint for what the post-exilic temple should look like. And uh, when they built it, uh, it wasn't. Right? Of course, it, that just means that that was one of many opinions as to what it should look like, right? And somebody was trying to get clout for their for their blueprint by saying, "Well, God gave this to the prophet Zeke, so this is the way we ought to do it." Well, there must have been other competing claims because that wasn't the way it was built. Uh, you might say, "Well, then they disobeyed God, right?" So. Nothing wrong with Ezekiel, something wrong with the temple. And there were such disputes, like the Qumran writers. Uh, they thought that the ritual at the Jerusalem temple was heretical, and so they boycotted it. You know, there could have been people that did the same thing, because it doesn't fit Ezekiel, I'm not going. It's not a real temple. Who knows? Uh, I don't know that we have any evidence of that debate, but I sure wouldn't be surprised. But at any rate... Um, some said, look, uh, it doesn't match what happened. I guess God could have got Zerubbabel and the others to do the uh, building on the blueprint of Ezekiel, but uh, he didn't, so uh, it must be his will for it to be the way it is. Uh, hey, maybe this will be the blueprint of a temple during the Millennial Kingdom in the future. Yeah, yeah, that's a ticket. So um, it stayed in there. And this bunch of deliberations, we're told, occurred, uh, I guess, around uh, 90 or so CE. And from there on in, there's no real uh, attempt to add anything or subtract anything. Uh, so the Jewish canon. Uh, what about the Christian canon? It looks as if... And here I'm just shamelessly dependent upon uh, the brilliant David Trobish in his book, The First Edition of the New Testament. It looks as if the 27-book canon or list was an edition prepared along with a, a rearranged Septuagint Greek Old Testament. It was a Bible prepared by somebody in the second century, most likely Polycarp of Smyrna. There are a lot of individual things that, that bear the stamp of an individual uh, editor uh, in it. And so uh, that seems to have come about around 130 to 150, somewhere in there. But uh, the th that was one possibility. There was no official line on that. 
uh, though uh, not long afterward, Origin was uh, experimenting with uh, canon lists that didn't quite match uh, the Muratorian canon uh, from either the 2nd or the 4th century. Uh, there's a debate over that. That had a somewhat different canon. Irenaeus had uh, yet a different one. I mean, very similar, all of them, but some had a few books, uh, some didn't. And, uh, and there were plenty more floating around. Well, it seems that in the time of Athanasius, the, that the the uh, twenty seven book canon was declared the official list. It wasn't compiled then, right? It had been around for a couple of hundred years, but Athanasius sent around an encyclical in three sixty seven C.E. or A.D. whatever you prefer. Said, okay, these are the books that we're, that we're going to use now, and no other ones. And that is probably what led the monks of St. Pacomius in Egypt to uh, squirrel away all of their nifty books like the Apocryphon of John, the Apocalypse of James, the Gospel according to Thomas, uh, and so on, uh, to, to, to take these books and hide them in the hills, because uh, they knew that the guys that brought the letter telling them only these 27, would be back to check. They'd be making the rounds again. Hey, I, I thought uh, you knew that we're, we're not using Thunder Perfect Mind anymore, right? Uh, give me the match. Well, they said to themselves, apparently, well, we can't use them. That doesn't mean uh, nobody else ever can. Let's hide them. Who knows? Maybe they snuck up there and read them anyway in, in secret. But uh, and so it's the the latter part of the 4th century, 367, that that became official. Though even that didn't stop people from using it. We have, and copying the other books, even in the more or less contemporary Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus, we have extra books, the Shepherd of Hermas, uh, the Epistle of Barnabas, things like that. And, uh, the Ar and a couple of the Monophysite churches had... Uh, had their own lists. Um, the Armenian and the Ethiopian churches and Coptic churches have loads of extra New Testament books. So it didn't go on everywhere, but even in the so-called Orthodox churches, it took a good while for this to settle out and to really call the tune. Now, I've spent more time on that than I am able to spend, realistically, on the uh, the question of when were things written, because that is really a huge mess. Uh, Wellhausen and Kuhnen and the other uh, great higher critics suggested that the prophets were probably about the earliest writings we have, starting in around the... Uh, oh, uh, the... Uh, mm, I guess, uh, well, there, there are problems there with when were those individual texts written, but uh, you had Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea and all these guys back in uh, the, the ninth century and onward, BCE. And uh, then the, uh, the Torah was the Pentateuch, though based on, in some cases, much earlier traditions, uh, that would have uh, been written after the prophets, compiled perhaps at the time of Ezra in the 5th century BCE as part of the Persian imperial-backed uh, reformulation of, uh, of Jewish worship, Judaism, after the Babylonian exile. The uh, the history books, um, which uh, note first suggested, were one long continuous epic, from including what we call Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. That would have been written during the Babylonian exile, uh, which uh, started about five. Uh, 86 BCE and lasted for some 50 years. Uh, I say some 50 years is a little vague because it's hard to... to there were different decrees that uh, would have allowed Jews to, to return to uh, Judea and different dates, but uh, anyway, it was about 50 years later. 
and uh, the, uh, the the scribes who compiled the Deuteronomic history from these books did it as one massive cautionary tale. Look, here we are, cool in our heels by the river Chebar in Babylon. Uh, this uh, and it's because, as a nation, we disobeyed God and welched on the covenant uh, He He made with us. And uh, this uh, this could happen again. So don't be unfaithful to the covenant. Uh, something worse might happen to you. Okay, so that and that became known. Uh, we call it now scholarly folks call it the Deuteronomic or Deuteronomistic uh, history. Now that may originally have begun with Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy then got sawed off and added on to the Pentateuch, uh, which was a compilation of the J and E epics and the priestly code. And those again may go back more. They may be more ancient because they're oral traditions that were codified and so on. The at least J and E may be archaic, at least the material. They were collected together much in the same way the Brothers Grimm collected nursery rhymes, fairy tales, bedtime stories to preserve them. Uh, and uh, that's apparently what they did. They went around the country interviewing priests and shamans and attendants of shrines to get all of their lore and uh, put it together. The priestly code was probably put together in the Babylonian exile, too, for the reason that uh, in Babylon you know, there was no temple for for uh, Jews to use, and so uh, they would be tempted to forget all about Judaism and assimilate to uh, Babylonian religion. They, oh, no, we don't want to do that, nor do we want to forget the uh, uh, rituals and regulations of the temple, so let's write it down for posterity, and it looks like that's the latest of the, uh, the sources, J, E, and P, that... Uh, were sewn together probably in the time of Ezra um, and uh, that became the Tetratuch and eventually um, as note and OTH suggests uh, Deuteronomy was chopped off and added to that uh, who knows um, other people would say no Deuteronomy was already there uh, and it certainly establishes this philosophy of history you keep up your end of the covenant God will bless you Israel, uh, but if uh, you abandon it, God's going to hand you over to calamities, uh, large and small. And uh, so maybe that already existed, and the Deuteronomic historians d decided, well, let's show what happened. And uh, they tried to make it look like it was all the, the advances of Israel was because they were faithful. All the setbacks shown in the stories were because they lapsed into idol worship or whatever, which doesn't exactly even fit the material. It's like they're cramming square pegs into round holes, but that makes it all the more obvious what their agenda was. Um, using old traditions as, mo as tiles for a new mosaic, some of them don't quite fit. Um, okay, and uh, so these became known as the former prophets. Uh, what the heck? They're they're not uh, prophetic books in the same way that Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, and the others are, right? Well, no, they're not. But this makes sense nonetheless because it's the Deuteronomic history. It's based on uh, the prophetic view of history found in Deuteronomy and uh, in the other uh, prophetic books like Isaiah, Jeremiah. Again, it's very, very clear that these books interpret the reversals of fortune in Israel and Judah to their uh, unfaithfulness to the covenant, right? Well, um, the, uh, there were some of the wisdom books that seemed to have been written in the time of the uh, Babylonian exile, or as I almost prefer by Babylonian diaspora because this this is getting really complicated and it gets much more so. But some of these books, like Job and Ecclesiastes, appear to come from a time when when agnosticism and cynicism were rampant because you find a, a dissatisfaction around the seventh century or so of, with the old view that uh, Israel is one continuous creature almost 
and so that that future generations may be punished for what their ancestors did, whether the future generations themselves did it or not. Uh, and But that's all right, because we're part of the same organic whole. Well, later on, people began to be more individualistic and to say, I don't see how that's fair. How can I, you know, like it says in Sodom and Gomorrah's story, shall not the judge of all the earth be just? And so uh, in Deuteronomy, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, you have uh, independently, it seems, three different statements on God's behalf that, yes, you're right, you got a point. So God will no longer judge one generation for what another did. You won't inherit uh, their guilt or their punishment. You'll Each individual will be judged on what they've done, good or bad. But then, whammo, the conquest uh, by Babylon. And so a lot of people apparently said, what gives? This is worse than before. Uh, surely, I mean, you know, we could say before, well, we didn't do anything to deserve this, but the answer was yes, but your parents did, and God visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generation, and like it or lump it, that's the way it goes. Uh, but uh, now we're supposed to be judged just on what we've done uh, and we're still getting screwed? What is this? It made the problem more acute. Well, a lot of things happened at this point. Um, you had the rise of apocalyptic as a way, though there's much more to it than this, but this was one way of dealing with the perceived injustice. Well, uh, we're losing the game now, uh, but don't worry, we're going to have another shot at it either in a heavenly world of rewards or in a future kingdom of God in which the saints of God will, uh, pious Jews, will either have their own independent kingdom again or will take over the world, different shadings on this thing, and it'll be the, the pagans and the wicked who, who get theirs, right? And uh, so, yeah, we got to wait for the resurrection of the dead, but it'll be worth it. Don't give up on God. Um, there's a great image in Elie Wiesel's um, The Trial of God, where a bunch of uh, Jewish uh, rabbis are in a Nazi concentration camp, uh, you know, enduring unimaginable horrors, and they decide to put God on trial there in the, uh, the barracks, and uh, somebody is uh, appointed to read all the crimes and to defend God, uh, to to uh, accuse God, and Satan shows up to be God's defender. Well, it doesn't work, and at the end of the trial, these pious Jews uh, rule that God is guilty. Uh, he he is in the wrong, and once the trial is concluded, okay, it's time for prayer. Interesting, right? Even though they couldn't. Uh, deny. Uh, this, this is sort of the one answer to what uh, Ivan Karamazov says in the Brothers Karamazov, the great inquisitor. I can't worship God because if I say, well, whatever he does is fine with me, then I'm, uh, I'm an accomplice. I'm saying, well, uh, the death of innocent children, it's, uh, well, God said it, so it must be okay. Like a sickeningly obsequious spin doctor, uh, the, the press spokesman for, for a politician. Uh, well, whatever he does is right. Uh, uh, you can't do that. Uh, I can't lose my soul in order to save it, uh, Ivan says. And uh, th this was an answer to that. Uh, look, I'm not letting him get away with it, but he's God and I'm going to worship him. You know, with this uh, protest, I'm worshiping him under protest. Interesting. Uh, well, okay, so the, the doctrine of resurrection came about under the influence of Zoroastrianism, which they knew through the Persians during the exile, right? Well, also, uh, Job and Ecclesiastes were written. Uh, Job, because he, this guy is the paradigm case of righteous sufferers. Right? And uh, he's saying, look, I I've been faithful the whole time. I I I'd be willing to accept it if I had done something wrong and God afflicted me as he did. But I what really hurts is that I didn't. Why on earth is this happening? Uh, and uh, the because uh, he figures God's in charge, it must be okay with God. But why? I, I was playing by the rules. What explains this? And 
his uh, three comforters, his friends, uh, uh, Larry, Moe, and Curly, show up, and, and they say, come on, Joe, let's face it, uh, you must have done something wrong. Why don't you admit it and come clean, and God will forgive you? And, and Job says, look, I, I'd be happy to admit it, but I, I can't let God off the hook. Uh, he's become a stalker. He's become a terrorist. Uh, you tell me what's going on. Finally, God shows up and, and says that, uh, you know, Job, what the heck do you think you're saying? And he's, he goes through all these weird paradoxes of nature, the migration of birds, the gathering of the stars in constellations, the, uh, the, the Leviathan and, uh, and Rahab and Behemoth and so on. He says, can you explain any of this to me, Mr. Smart Guy? And Job says, <laughs> uh, now that you mention it, I, I guess I can't. Uh, maybe I should have uh, held my tongue. And yeah, he says, yeah, I I'd say you should have. You are a mere mortal and you're going to psych me out? You're going to second guess the creator of the universe? Good luck! And uh, so uh, what a fascinating idea. Th this is what Schleiermacher would later call agnostic piety. It it's not like in Elie Wiesel, where God is guilty, but you're loyal to him anyway. Well, I'll not let him get away with it. No, you say, look, I, I guess it was pretty foolish of me to, to think God has to play by my rules. I I'm just a you know, two-legged uh, piece of protoplasm here. I, I, there must be so much more to God. I, I, he must have his reasons or whatever. I don't know, but I'll stop calling him to account. It's ridiculous. And uh, so that's, so it's pious, but it's agnostic. And uh, Ecclesiastes too, look, who knows what's going on out there. You might as well just do your best before you die because you're gonna, and that's going to be it. Right? No Sheol, no resurrection, no nothing. Well, both of these books, in a way, say you just can't reckon with God. You, you can't say, shall not the judge of all the earth be just, because you don't know what justice would be for him. And, of course, this has become one of the pillars of theodicy ever since, that, uh, yeah, God is just, but really who knows what that means on, uh, on his level. Um, it, to take it in the other direction, do your pets love you? I mean, they, they uh, cuddle up with you. Oh, they must really love me. Well, do you really think they have a big enough brain to uh, feel emotions like that? Well, no, they don't. No dogs are going to write uh, love poems to their masters or anything. And yet, what you're interpreting as love is kind of their equivalent on their level. It may be pack instinct. Who knows? Uh, but yeah, sure, there, there's a kind of continuity. Uh, and, you know, pursue it the other direction. There is a justice with God, but we're talking about the, the Lord of the universe. So who can really say what it would have to entail? Uh, that's pretty good uh, thinking, it seems to me. And, of course, it's, it's uh, in a sense, a kind of sour grapes theology. It's making virtue of necessity, but that sometimes you do learn by taking a beating. And I don't mean to ridicule that. So, th this, so something must have happened to make loads of Jews say, why are we <laughs> suffering for, for nothing? So that it looks like the exile would be the best place to, uh, to place those. Okay, the exile is over. Uh, not for everybody. A lot of Jews stayed there. Uh, but uh, an elite of priests and scribes comes back to Jerusalem and uh, they... Uh, with the authority of the Persian government behind him, and they kind of start pushing around the Jews who never left. They and their ancestors remained and were worshiping at the ruins of the temple in Jerusalem. And when uh, Zerubbabel and uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and these guys show up, they're welcomed. Oh, what? You've got funds to rebuild the temple? Wow, that's great. We'd like to help. No, I'm afraid you can't. Uh, because look at you guys. Uh, you're not really keeping kosher. You, you don't know what you're doing. You've married pagan women. Uh, you can divorce them all and then maybe we'll talk. But until you do, get the heck out of here. And uh, this did not engender a lot of gratitude, as you can imagine.
And uh, these guys, you know, hey, we're the ones, God. You ought to be grateful to us, Isaiah 53. Uh, you thought we were sinners, and that's why we were taken away. No, no, no. We bore your sins, idol worshipers, polytheists, etc. So, you know, no love lost there. Well, the, uh, the books of Jonah and Ruth probably come from that period, this would be like the 5th century B.C., the 400s or so, because uh, they're, they're both occasioned by this incredible program of Ezra and Nehemiah to split up homes. This, the, the, not the way it's treated in 1 Corinthians 7, right? If you have a spouse who's an unbeliever but they're willing to live with you, don't make trouble. Right. Well, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah said, no, no, we can't have any of those mongrels in here, only pure bread Jews. Well, that seems to be the point of the book of Ruth, to, to say here is a, a Moabitess who uh, sort of grafted into the, the vine of Israel by marrying a Jew, and then once he dies... She sticks with her Jewish mother-in-law and is more faithful than any actual daughter could be. And uh, so th in this, and then she becomes an ancestress of King David. So don't tell me you can't uh, marry into Israel, Ezra, Nehemiah. Sure you can't. Take a look at Ruth. Now, was there really a Ruth and all that? Nah, you know, but, but it's a good example. Why couldn't this be? Same thing with Jonah. Oh, man, I love this book. Right, Jonah is tapped on the shoulder by God, who says, you know, the, the Assyrians are pretty rough bastards, but I'd like to give them a second chance. Joe, I'd like you to go and preach repentance to them. And he says, what? Assyria, right? Uh, Nineveh, the, the, the conquerors, those ruthless butchers, are those the people you mean? You, you want me to go preach repentance and a chance for salvation for these guys? <laughs> I don't think so. And so uh, instead of going uh, east to Assyria, he buys a by passage on a ship to Tarshish, the opposite direction totally. And you know what happens. Uh, God sends a storm to sink the boat if they don't get rid of Jonah. And he says, look, guys, uh, this is my fault. you got to throw me out of here, and then, then you'll be saved. And they do, reluctantly. And God sends a huge fish to uh, swallow Jonah and to deposit him back on shore in Canaan. And uh, he says, all right, all right, I get the message. And he goes up to uh, Nineveh. Whoa, whoa, to the bloody city of Nineveh. And astonishingly, these bloodthirsty pagans repent and convert to Yahweh worship, right? Uh, Jehovah's their God now. And uh, it worked. Uh, revival in, the, in Nineveh, hallelujah. And uh, is, is Jonah happy about this? No way. He goes up to a hill overlooking Nineveh, and uh, it's hot. He wants some shade. All he can find is a gourd tree, and he sits down under it. Uh, and, uh, and then some sort of a worm comes out and uh, chops the tree down. It's, it couldn't have been much uh, shelter, right? And uh, Jonah starts grousing about it. Damn it. Uh, and, and then God says, look at you. You're upset about this stinking gourd vine uh, getting chopped down. And there's this whole city of people who don't know their ass from their elbow. Now they've repented and, and you wish they hadn't. Uh, well, yeah, actually, uh, he, he says, uh, Jonah says to God, you know, I knew this would happen. Uh, and, of course, his point is he didn't want the, the Ninevites to repent and be saved. He wanted to see them nuked. Uh, and uh, so th who is this aimed at? Well, of course, chauvinistic Jews who felt vengeance for their traditional enemies. You can easily understand that, right? And that's the whole point of the book, that it, as tempting as it might be to just nurse a grudge and want vengeance, wouldn't it be better if you could uh, make your enemy into your friend? Uh, fellow Jews, do you really want to have this, this grudge against the, the pagans? You shouldn't. And of course, it's aimed at Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, we don't want any of those foreigners in here. At least that's the theory, and I think it's a 
pretty compelling one. It's a better guess than anybody else has about... Uh, th these are not my theories, by the way. Of course, I'm ripping this off from all, you know, generations of Old Testament scholars. Um, uh, how about the book of Psalms? They th That seems to have been a compilation of five earlier books of Psalms. And depending on whether you think Solomon's temple actually existed or not... Uh, that that determines what you think about the dates, because if you think Solomon's temple did exist, then the five hymnals would have been used there. But if you think the temple of Zerubbabel, later rebuilt by Herod the Great, if you think that was really the first temple, then presumably they were only used and written down in in that time, let's say in the in the third century B.C.E. and uh, or they may have been borrowed, as I believe Thomas L. Thompson thinks, from uh, other monarchies where they did have temples and so forth. That easily could happen, I guess. Uh, some of them may have been written in the second century BCE during the time of the Maccabees and so forth. A lot of scholars have thought that. It's very difficult to say. Uh, but the Book of Psalms, as we have with 100, it's very difficult to say. Uh, but the book of Psalms, as we have with 150 Psalms, uh, some of them in there a couple of times, uh, that appears to come from the, uh, the third century BCE, maybe later. The book of Proverbs, this is, a kind, this is also like a compilation of, Jesus, uh, it seven or nine? It's been so long since I've taught this, I've forgotten, but it's a compilation of several books of uh, Proverbs. Three of them are supposed to be compilations of Solomon's wise sayings. Several of the others are not. Uh, just the sayings of the wise, more sayings of the wise, the sayings of uh, Lemuel, of uh, Amasa, and, and so forth. Uh, some of them are, aren't even from Jewish sources. They, uh, they, they incorporate most of an Egyptian wisdom work uh, called uh, the Wisdom of Amenemophis. Uh, so... Uh, um, Hard to say. Uh, they're probably education manuals for scribes who would have been part of the uh, royal administration somewhere along the line, but kind of tough to say. Uh, what else have we got? Well, we mainly have there the law, the, the histories or former prophets, the guys like Isaiah and Jeremiah, the latter prophets, uh, and then the writings, the wisdom books and so forth. Well, the wisdom books are not just, uh, they're not all there are to the third section of the Hebrew canon. Uh, there you've got uh, uh, also, also rands that would have been in earlier categories, but they were written too late. Like there's the Great Chronicles, as some call them, or the Greater Chronicles. Our First and Second Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah, they may have been all one book, the Chronicler's History. That is a, uh, it's fascinating to compare that with the Deuteronomic history because it's essentially a rewriting of most of it, much of it verbatim, but with many significant changes. It was certainly rewritten by the priests to, uh, as to feather their bed to, to show just how important the priests were in the history of Israel with new miracle stories you never heard of and stuff like that. Daniel also, not really a prophet. In fact, Daniel had been an old uh, character known in Canaanite religion as a, an ancient patriarch and judge. And, uh, th but they make him into a Jewish prophet during the, the exile in Babylon, predicting uh, the war with the Seleucid Empire in the middle of the second century BCE. It was written then, though. It, uh, the, the events that were happening and on the horizon were presented as if they had been predicted centuries before by Daniel. So it was sort of a prophetic book, but it was way too late. It was written after the uh, the little canon within a canon uh, of uh, the prophets, so too late to add it in. And uh, same thing, Chronicles. Why wasn't it included in the former prophets? Well, because it hadn't been written yet, and so on. Uh, so there's... Uh, that covers most of it, and uh, but I say this is really a mess because though that is more or less the traditional sketch of it, with Old Testament minimalism, 
a lot of things have been thrown up for grabs. It, it may be that almost everything in the Old Testament is much, much later, much more recent, uh, and that it's virtually all fiction because there's no archaeological evidence for, for anything, really, until the latest, most boring parts of the Deuteronomic history, the House of Omri in the north and... Uh, Judah isn't even a monarchy until very late in the day during the time of the Assyrian Empire, and uh, it's, it just seems almost all legend and fiction. It was very difficult to, to say uh, when it was written, so I've just given you the, and that's all still, I mean, there are many, many views, even among minimalists. I think that is the wave of the future. I think the, we're really going to have to do a whole lot of reshuffling. Uh, so, a big question mark beside everything I said. Now, what about the New Testament? I don't even want to get started there. You know, the traditional view is that the earliest works were the epistles attributed to Paul, uh, which means they'd be written pretty much in the decade of 50 to 60, roughly, um, CE or AD. Um, and then the Gospels would have been written... Uh, 10 or 20 years starting then after that mark the first uh, 10 or 20 years later matthew and luke both using mark and then around 90 to 100 the gospel of john would have been written around the same time as the epistles first second and third john and then the book of revelation during the time of the emperor domitian again right around the end of the first century um, Acts would have been written as the immediate continuation of Luke's gospel, and the other epistles written around the same time as Paul's by his contemporaries, James the Just and Peter and so forth. Um, but this it has eroded into a sand heap, because uh, once you start questioning authorship, as you really do have to do, then the dates go wild also. Uh, most scholars, uh, mainstream critical scholars, not axe-grinding apologists, right, but mainstream critics, would say that Paul didn't write about half of the epistles attributed to him that uh, he w apparently wrote Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, and Philemon. But 2nd Thessalonians, Colossians, uh, Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and Titus are pseudepigraphical. Um, F.C. Bauer thought it was just 1st and 2nd Corinthians, most of Romans, and Galatians. But I tend to go with W.C. Van Manen, uh, who said, no, if you apply the same criteria consistently, you'll find that uh, none of these epistles are written by the same guy, and they're all filled with anachronisms. That means they couldn't have gone back to the time when we presume Paul lived. So, you know, it's, most uh, mainstream scholars will admit that all the stuff attributed to Peter in and out of the canon is pseudepigraphical. He didn't write any of that, but for some reason they have much more trouble with the notion that all the Pauline epistles are pseudepigraphical. Uh, and uh, so, and who wrote the Gospels? We, we really have no idea. There's a surprisingly scanty evidence of them uh, until a l very late in the first or into the second century, and I tend to think they're all written in the second century. Who oh boys so are the Gospels even late? Are they later than the Epistles or contemporary with them uh, or even earlier? <laughs> who the heck knows? I don't pretend to know. Uh, so that's all uh, up in the air. Uh, so I hope that is a, uh, well, I know that is not a satisfying answer to your question, because I got the same questions, and I don't know the answers. But that's, uh, you know, at least kind of a survey. Um, okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Ken, for that one. Uh, David Martin, now uh, here's an exciting one. Who tattooed the testicles of Jesus? In Revelation 19.16, it says there is a name written on his thigh, which, of course, is a euphemism for the testicles. Uh, see Genesis 24.2 and others. Yeah, that, that is right, uh, though it, it could mean the scrotum. Um, but anyway, uh, is King of Kings written on one and Lord of Lords on the other? Because, you know, that is the name, right? King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
Uh, I've always thought it's pretty strange, but uh, I, uh, I think, I mean, that is enough to justify Derrida's term of phallogocentrism, right? I mean, that is just perfect uh, for that. And, uh, and of course, the, the importance of the penis or the thigh uh, for uh, oath-taking and all that implies the authority of males exclusively, right? So, yeah, there is a, a point to that. Um, I don't, I mean, it, it is, all you can say is it's pretty weird, though not really surprising imagery. You find the same thing, you know, this sounds like a joke, it isn't, though. When uh, it says he will rule the nations with a rod of iron, well, what do you suppose that is? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it is uh, phallocentrism, phallogocentrism. Uh, and, uh, you know, despite being a rightist in uh, politics, I tend to go philosophically with the, the radicals like Derrida and, and others. Uh, and I think these guys are probably right, and so basically you're right on there. That is, that is the name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, thanks Dave. John Adams and Leeds in the, the UK. I wonder why it is Paul is so keen that men in the Corinthian church should pray or prophesy with heads uncovered, 1 Corinthians 11.4. How is the man's head, Christ, dishonored if contemporary Jewish men and pagan men prayed, prayed and sacrificed with heads uncovered, presumably as a mark of respect to God or the gods. Let's just take a look at that passage. It's uh, sure an interesting one. Um, yeah, 1 Corinthians 11, 2. Uh, by the way, I must uh, commend John for remembering something that used to be understood commonly but isn't anymore he he gets it that prophecy with a c is a, a noun but prophesy with an s is a verb so keep up the good work hey um uh, this is Paul, and I mean apostle Paul I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ the head of a woman is her husband and the head of Christ is God any man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled dishonors her head. It is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a woman will not veil herself, then she should cut off her hair. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her wear a veil. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he's the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a woman ought to have a veil on her head because of the angels. Wow. Pretty weird. Uh, but it does kind of make sense. I think that uh, though you're right about the covering of the head, the, the Jewish yarmulke is an example of that. Men cover their head uh, to denote their their um, humility before their creator. But this seems, I think, to presuppose the, well, of course, with prophesying in the congregation, it's a charismatic sort of a thing, the congregation that also speaks in tongues, which is almost the same thing, right? Inspired speech. I think the head covering business presupposes that uh, women did prophesy in the open uh, service there, service of uh, the, the church. And uh, that is not in question, though it is in chapter 14, which no doubt comes from a different author, but the uh, they, the women have the right to, to prophesy because they're inspired, right? Your young men will see visions, your old men will see uh, dream dreams, uh, pour out my spirit on all your sons and your daughters, all that stuff, right? Well, what is in question is whether they can unveil their heads, and I think he's just talking about the prophesying virgins, as they're called in Acts 21. Uh, they, uh, whereas uh, it seems to me, all told, the idea is that uh, that wives who wouldn't be prophesying must cover their heads in accordance with this thing with uh, 
the analogy of women having long hair. That is a natural covering. The veil is a supplementary one, but it's brazen uh, and shocking for women to go around without veils, either over their head or over their face. And that's a long-standing thing in, in the ancient world, right? And take a look at the, the Middle East today, right? Uh, but the prophesying virgins or widows, charismatic celibate women, they were not under the authority of a man, which is why they could be mouthpieces for, for divine prophecy. Uh, the I think the same would hold true with men, that they probably... Um, would only be prophets if they were celibate, but that isn't absolutely clear. I think it's implicit, but you know, not absolutely clear. Uh, so we're talking about the uh, the the charismatic order of widows and and virgins, really synonymous. They could pray and prophesy in public. Married women could not, and did have to be veiled. Well, the writer here wants the the prophesying virgins also to be veiled. Why were they not? I think it's because the uh, of uh, the example of Moses, right? When he went into the tent of meeting uh, to uh, shoot the breeze with God, uh, he took his veil off. There's a discussion of this in Second Corinthians, and when he came out of the tent having been exposed to the radiance of God, the glory of God, face to face, uh, he, his face was shining like the sun. He didn't know it the first time, and everybody's cringing away from him in fear, as if they'd just seen Casper the Friendly Ghost or something. And uh, seeing this, once Moses realizes what's going on, it says in the Pentateuch, he then veils his face. But whenever he would go into the, the tent of meeting, he would unveil it again, and, God, and it says that Moses was, like, was unlike any subsequent prophet. He talked face to face with God as a man does with his friend. Well, I think that's the thinking, if not the actual reason for what uh, the uh, celibate women uh, prophetesses did in Corinth. They said, we are direct receptacles of the word of God, like Moses was, so we shouldn't be veiled. All right, Mrs. So-and-so there, yeah, all right, the order of creation would apply there. Uh, now, what is this thing with the glory of? Well, the man was uh, made for God to have fellowship with him, so he doesn't need to obscure his face or his head. But the woman, and uh, here's the you know typical ancient chauvinism, the woman was made for the benefit of the man, implying she doesn't relate directly to God. I, I don't know what sounds outrageous. But in the ancient world, um, women were not held responsible to know about all the obligations of the Torah. That was for the men folk, because, of course, women were considered on the same level as children, basically. And sometimes they were, because often men would be much older than their wives, and they did relate to them almost as children. Uh, this is why child marriage is one of the, the sources for the, it fueled the engine of uh, of the denigration of women uh, over many centuries, right? Um, so uh, the married women have to be veiled, cannot pray or prophesy in the public assembly. Then uh, the, uh, the celibate women can pray or prophesy publicly, and shouldn't they uh, do so with... Uh, unveiled face because remember they're they're uh, receiving prophecy revelation on the spot right there and then it's not something they got in a dream at home and are now conveying i guess they could be veiled for that but that's not what's happening they're prophesying in the public uh, gathering there so they're figuring uh, we, we shouldn't i mean they're the glory of god they're immediately reflecting the uh, the, the divine glory by receiving the word of god so I think they have the more consistent argument, but 1 Corinthians 7 is not actually by contemporary of these people. Uh, it's, uh, it's part of this, this ongoing putting down of women, domesticating women. Just like Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza says, women had a much more 
egalitarian role. And I mean, that's common. That's not some feminist speculation or propaganda. This is just common in the history of sectarian evolution. Everybody's equal. Everybody's on the same footing. Nobody's got any paper credentials. It's just how God deals with people. Same thing in uh, early Pentecostalism, right? They, they would ordain women and men equally. Uh, what about those Bible passages that said otherwise? Well, I don't know about that, but I do know God is making women preach and prophesy. I don't want to stand in his way. And it's only later, once a once radical group starts to reassimilate to the larger society and its more uh, bourgeois values, that you have stuff like this. Eh, I don't care if they're prophesying or not. they got to have their, uh, their, their veil on. Um... So I think that's really what's going on there. Uh, think also of Second Corinthians, where it says, "We all with all with unveiled faces behold the glory of the Lord and are transformed into His likeness." Again, that's Moses, uh, who's also. I mean, that very passage is uh, is mentioned there in the same context, and I think that's uh, that underlies the uh, the business in. Uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, so it isn't a matter of reverence exactly, except insofar that married women ought to show respect and submission, which it does explicitly say, uh, to their husbands uh, as uh, the men do to God, but the men are the image of God and therefore his glory, his reflection, uh, but the women are not. They're at, a, at one remove. Now, somebody, this was controversial even then because somebody inserted after this thing with the, well, remember, Adam was first, not Eve, right? Uh, uh, but somebody then added, uh, but ever since then, men have been born from women, so, you know, that kind of mitigates that. And then somebody added, and what the heck, we're all equal in Christ anyway. So you can see that uh, there are uh, barnacles on the hull there, and people weren't willing to just accept what this said. I think there are a few places where you can see back and forth debates there. Okay, uh, let's see. Another uh, UK Bible geek, Walid uh, from England, says, my question is, why didn't Paul include his mates on the way to Jerusalem amongst his witnesses in 1 Corinthians 15? Uh, this, uh, I, I think you you probably mean going from Jerusalem to Damascus in uh, Acts 9 and then I think it's 24 and 26, more or less the same story three times. Didn't they, weren't they on hand when uh, he saw the risen Christ? and got set straight. Well, yeah, but remember, you compare those stories, there is uh, some confusion over who saw or heard what. Uh, and uh, if, and of course, I think that the compiler of the list in 1 Corinthians 15 had never heard of that story. So that, that'd be one simple answer, because uh, the story is not part of the Pauline biography. Uh, it's uh, it's borrowed from uh, Euripides the Bacchae and from Second Maccabees chapter three about uh, Pentheus and Heliodorus. It is just adopted by uh, Luke for Paul's uh, hagiography. But even if he did know the stories, remember um, it's inconsistent. It says that Paul's friends saw the light. Even though later on, Paul is said to have seen the Lord in the light, but they didn't. They saw the light. Uh, I'm sorry, they saw the light, but didn't hear the voice. But then it says in another version, they didn't see the uh, light, but did hear the voice. So there's some uh, lack of clarity as to whether he could have said that they had seen uh, the risen Christ. And now uh, this is if the writer of the list knew the Acts accounts. I don't think he did, but if he did, I think he still would not have included them. Um, why don't the women appear, uh, the, the, the Yahya sisterhood who were at the uh, tomb, according to Mark and the others? Well, I think those were unknown to the writer. They really were traditions from the morning rituals of the uh, charismatic women. 
uh, who are for whom the uh, the Mary Magdalene and the others are stand-ins in the story, just as in Egypt the women mourned Osiris and uh, they were the real-world counterparts of Isis and Nephthys, the consorts of Osiris who mourned his death and sought his body and so on. Uh, and uh, so I think that uh, the uh, it's just like how in uh, at the end of Mark the uh, the women are told to tell the disciples to meet the risen Jesus, but they don't. Well, this is a way of saying, yeah, I know you've never heard of this, but it happened anyway. Well, that you've never heard of this, right? The writer of the list in First Corinthians fifteen had never heard of it either. Maybe it hadn't been made up yet, or maybe it wasn't part of his circles. It was a a mythic script for the Christian women's mourning rituals. Uh, let's see. Uh, one more. Alexander says, um, which Bible scholars have made the following point? Imagine if Jesus, the carpenter, had spent his working life building a carrick ship and then on his resurrection had told his sailor fisherman disciples to meet him at uh, Akko or Acre, Haifa, Israel, on the shores of the Mediterranean, and they had sailed together out into the Atlantic with Jesus calming all the storms, turning salt water into wine, and finally arriving in South America a week later, spending a further couple of years sailing around the rest of the Americas, spreading the gospel before heading off for Australia with the urgent message, thus giving the impression, thy kingdom come double quick. Instead, we have a Jesus who only sails across a little lake, Tiberias, Sea of Galilee, and leaves it for another 1,500 years until the gospel is taken to the Americas. It hardly shows a sense of urgency or using one's talents to the full extent. Maybe Jesus didn't need an ocean-going ship. His disciples' fishing boat would have done the job. With Jesus in the boat, you can smile at the storms. What we get is a Jesus, son of God, who spends his carpenter life supposedly making common tables and chairs, which no one even thinks to preserve for, for posterity after his uh, couple of years of fame as a traveling healer and risen Christ. You would think people could have made a fortune with the line, sit where Jesus sat. Um, well, you know, the Mormons come as close to this as anybody does by saying, look, he didn't even need the ship like uh, Lehi and his family did when they left Jerusalem for the Western Hemisphere back in the, on the eve of the Babylonian conquest. He just uh, ascended and kept going. He uh, went over to the Americas and preached to the, uh, the, uh, the Aztecs and so on who remembered him as Quetzalcoatl. Um, that, well, that's justified, uh, rationalized with a Bible quote, I have other sheep that I must join with this flock, and so on. But uh, there, this teems with interesting stuff. You know, there is, I think it's one of the acts of Peter, or just the act of Peter, I think it's called in the non Gamadi text. Oh, I'd have the wrong text. Uh, that... Uh, actually has Jesus lead the disciples in a boat to a far shore. He poses as a diamond merchant called Lithargoel, and he eventually reveals himself to them. So somebody had a vague idea of this kind of thing. Um, but uh, if you ask why didn't he build a boat or maybe even a submarine sea view or something and go to the Western Hemisphere to preach, why didn't he just invent an airplane or a Star Trek teleporter? Or why didn't he just speak to the whole human race like in the movie, The Next Voice You Hear? Uh, you know, why not? Uh, if, if this is really s supernatural revelation from a real God, it, it looks like everything would have looked, would have happened, uh, it looks like it would have if there wasn't a God active in this, but it was human beings spreading a man-made message that God had spoken to man. And uh, surely that is what happened. I mean, if, if it is so urgent that the gospel go out to all creation, then why uh, not invent travel technology or just speak to everybody right it's uh, it's limited to human resources and abilities because it's an altogether human thing 
Um, Jesus as the carpenter. Well, I can't resist waxing on this one. As Gaze of Vermesh shows in Jesus the Jew, to my satisfaction, the notion that Jesus worked as a carpenter is a misunder probably a Gentile misunderstanding of a proverb preserved a couple of times in the Mishnah, where uh, when uh, the sages are batting around a difficult passage of the Torah, and I can't quite figure what it means. Uh, and of course, there are plenty of those, right? They they would uh, throw up their hands in frustration and said, this is a passage that no carpenter, son of carpenters, uh, could uh, could figure out. In other words, somebody who learned the skill from somebody who knew the skill, you know, a very capable carpenter, but it's a metaphor for a, an interpreter of scripture, right? You're talking about the Bible, not uh, not bookcases and tables. And what is the setting of the scene in Mark? He's, exp he's expounding on the scriptures in a synagogue. He's not hammering stuff together in an episode of this old house, right? And uh, another similar passage uh oh that we had a carpenter son of carpenters um, same same point but surely that's what it means in fact the johannine parallel says uh, not uh, oh isn't this the son of the carpenter but rather it just sort of translates the metaphor how did he get such learning isn't he the son of joseph and all that uh, so uh, no real education, right? So, of course, wink, wink, it's because he's the son of God and the Logos. So uh, Jesus wasn't a carpenter, even if there was a historical Jesus. Um, and about the, uh, the stuff Jesus did or didn't make, you know, Justin Martyr actually said that there were people around in his day, in the latter half of the second century, who did have some of the stuff Jesus made, plow handles and stuff. Now, that's just got to be an early example of Christian relics, right? Yeah, my uh, fishing pole here was uh, whittled by the Son of God. It reminds me of one of my favorite Don Imus routines on his uh, hilarious album, One Sacred Chicken to Go. And it's part of a routine where he, he's he's... He's portraying Billy Saul Hargis, a uh, fraudulent radio evangelist, and he uh, has this, he's selling sacred fried chicken. One sacred chicken to go, the one with the heavenly glow, etc. He also uh, is selling passage to heaven. He says, most people think when they die, they go right to heaven automatically, but I'm here to tell you that's not so. No, you have to buy, a, 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 you have to get on board a plane and go there, and you have to buy a ticket. Well, I'm representing the wings of him. Uh, just buy your ticket and you'll go to heaven. Most Protestants go coach. Uh, and, well, in one of these things, he's uh, he's saying that uh, most people know that Jesus was the Son of God, and before he embarked on his ministry, he was a carpenter. Uh, he made several sets of fine dining room and living room furniture, and Billy Saul has them. So, uh, he's you know, you can get your own uh, dining room table made by the Son of God, uh, you know, just as you say. So, I don't know about biblical exegetes coming up with this, but... Uh, Radio evangelist did. Uh, Billy Saul Hoggis. Billy Saul, tell us all. Okay, I guess that's about it for today's Bible Geek. We'll be back again more or less soon. In the meantime, I'll be working on uh, blaming Jesus for Jehovah and uh, Holy Fable. I'll let you know when they're ready. And Oh yeah, another thing. Uh, American Atheist Press is doing a, a new uh, revised version of half of my pre-Nicene New Testament. It'll be a paperback. Uh, it's, uh, it's called the Human Bible New Testament, and it's just the canonical 27 this time, and I've gone through it and made some revisions. So I think, And there's uh, some new introductory material as well, so I hope, I'll let you know when that becomes available, but it shouldn't be too long now. See you next time on The Bible Geek. But it shouldn't be too The Bible Geek was recorded by Robert M. Price and produced by John Felix and Sergeant Yovanovich. Theme song by John Morris. Visit us 
at robertmprice.mindvendor.com. For more info on Robert's projects, purchase Bible Geek merchandise, and click the ever-important Donate button. Send your questions to criticus at aol.com, and be sure to rate and review The Bible Geek on iTunes. Thanks for listening to The Bible Geek. I'm Torn Atkinson.